Okay. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove in Athampindika's Park. Then the Brahmin student Sabha, Todiya's son, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One, Master Gotama, what is the cause and condition why human beings are seen as inferior and superior? for people to be seen as short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor and wealthy, low-born and high-born, stupid and wise. What is the cause and condition, Master Gotama, why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? Now, listen very closely to this. Students, beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes being as inferior and superior. <coughs> I do not understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement, which he spoke in brief without expounding the meaning in detail. So that tells you right there, he's smart. Because he didn't just take what the Buddha said, and the Buddha would get quiet, and nobody says anything, he gets up and goes away. But Sabha was very clever in that he asked him to expound it more. It would be good if Master Gotama would teach me the Dhamma so I might understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. <coughs> then, student, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, yes, sir, the Brahmin student Sabha replied. The Blessed One said this, here, student, some man or woman kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of a body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination. and perdition, even in hell. Now, perdition and hell are one and the same thing. So I'm not going to repeat that like that again. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear, he does not reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, but instead comes back to the human state then wherever he is reborn, he is short-lived. This is the way, student, that leads to a short life. Namely, one kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. But here, student, some man or woman, abandoning the killing of living beings, abstains from killing living beings on purpose. That is a very important thing to say. Because when you, you have a body, just the fact that you have a body, beings die. But it's not your intention to kill them, so there is no wrongdoing. <clears throat> with rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings, 
because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death he reappears in a happy destination even in the heavenly world but if on the dissolution of the body after death he does not reappear in a happy destination in a heavenly world but instead comes back to the human state then wherever he is reborn he is long lived this is the way student that leads to long life namely abandoning the killing of living beings one abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside <clears throat> gentle and kindly one abides compassionate to all living beings it's it's a real interesting phenomena especially in Burma uh, the average person that doesn't doesn't follow Dhamma as closely as they can and they, they live their life men when they get to be 30 years old they start looking for a wife who is around 20 years old <coughs> and they eat the food that they normally eat which is very high in oil I mean oil so thick that things float in it and when they get to be six, 60 they have a heart attack and die now the interesting part of this is monks in Burma generally live to be between 85 and 100 because they keep their precepts they don't break their precepts by killing living beings and when you go and even now if I would go and see some of the people that I went to school with <coughs> 50 years ago <coughs> they would be hobbling around not healthy uh, having a lot of diseases and that sort of thing 50 years don't let me think about that again <laughs> <laughs> keep me distracted <laughs> <laughs> but it is kind of an interesting thing because monks generally live between 85 and, and 100 years old because of the choice of lifestyle here student some man or woman is given to injuring beings with a hand with a clod with a stick with a knife because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death he reappears in a state of deprivation but if instead he comes back to the human state then wherever he is reborn he is sickly uh, when I was in Burma I went out to some villages and I met a lady that was living in a heavy duty malaria area she never had malaria in her whole life and she was living where the mosquitoes were really thick a lot of people around her got very sick she, she was healthy her whole life and she lived to be a long, a long, long life. This is the way student that leads to sickliness. Namely, one is given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. But here, student, some man or woman is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife 
because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is healthy. This is the way, student, that leads to health. Namely, one is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife, with a car. As some, some animals get uh, run over quite often. Here, student, some man or woman is an angry, irritable character. Even when criticized a little, he is offended. <clears throat> he becomes angry, hostile, and resentful and displays anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is ugly. Now think about this. Um, I used to hand out to all of my students a mirror that they could carry with them. And I told them, especially when they were angry, to pull out the mirror and look at their face. The skin color changes, especially with Asians. They get black in the face. Their features are very, very ugly. And they are doing that to themselves. And then when, I, when they're smiling, I tell them to, put out, to pull out the mirror and see themselves smiling. And which way do they want to look? <clears throat> this is a way, student, that leads to ugliness. Namely, one is of an angry, irritable character and displays anger, hate, and bitterness. But here, student, one man or woman is not of an angry, irritable character. Even when criticized a lot, he is not offended, does not become angry, hostile, and resentful and does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is beautiful. This is the way, student, that leads to being beautiful Namely, one is not of an angry, irritable character and does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. One of the, the, the real advantages of practicing loving-kindness meditation is because your face does get beautiful. That's one of the advantages. It says that in the suttas. So... <clears throat> when I would have a lot of women doing a retreat and after a few days I would look out and their faces were starting to glow and become very nice. Their faces were soft and, and quite beautiful. And I told them that I ought to start trying to bottle some of this loving kindness because I'd make a fortune. And I let them all know personally that their faces were very beautiful because that's what was in their mind. Beautiful things. Not angry, not bitter, not wanting revenge because somebody wronged them in one way or another. <clears throat> Here, student, some man or woman is envious. One who envies, resents, and begrudges the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. 
because of performing and undertaking such action he reappears in a state of deprivation but if instead he comes back to the human state then wherever he is reborn he is uninfluential this is the way student that leads to being uninfluential namely one is envious towards the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. But here, student, some man or woman is not envious. He does, does one who does not envy, resent, begrudge the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. That is part of the Brahma Viharas too. And that is rejoicing in others' gains. Keeping your mind uplifted. Thinking, you know, they, they really deserve that because they're nice. And you don't hold any envy. Well, I want that. I want to be like that. Well, if you want to be like that, you have to act like that. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination, being happy with other people's success. For couples, the thing with being married is learning how to support each other and appreciate each other's good qualities and tell the other person of their good qualities. That leads to more balance in life. Okay, so being married means being a true partner that gets happy when another person is successful. and helps them and reminds them when they're feeling down how you appreciate their good qualities and tell them what those good qualities are. That's very much appreciated. When you, when you hear somebody that you trust, that you very much wish happiness for, they will respond to that in a very positive way. And that makes for a happy marriage. A lot of times in marriage, there, you always do this. I love that statement. You always act this way when this is like that. And I don't like that. And I want you to change. But if you overlook some of the, the little flaws and focus on the positive things, that takes away the fight. But if instead he comes back to the human state, wherever he is reborn, he is influential. Because you don't you don't envy other people their good their success it makes you happy that they're successful <clears throat> namely one is not envious toward the gain honors respect veneration salutation and received by others here, student, some man or woman does not give food, drink, clothing, uh, carriages, garlands, scents, unguents, beds, dwellings, and lamps to recluses and brahmins. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. 
But if instead he comes back to the human state, wherever he is reborn, he is poor. This is the way, student, that leads to poverty. Namely, one does not give food and requisites to recluses and brahmins. That's one of the reasons that monks, they will accept almost anything that's given as long as it's wholesome. We will accept anything that's given, but monks are not supposed to say thank you. Because if I say you give some, you offer some, some food, or you offer a robe, if I say thank you, what I'm doing is I'm making it a personal gift between you and me. So you don't make very much merit. Monks are supposed to say, uh, I rejoice in your merit for this gift, or to say sadhu, well done. Now, at one time, <coughs> I was in Australia, and I had, uh, I was there on the shortest day of the year. It was the longest day of the year on the other side of the equator, shortest day of the year here. And it was cold, and I'd just come from Malaysia, where it was 85 all the time, <coughs> and just great weather, and I'm walking around with Fahrenheit, it's about 60, and that cold was getting into my bones. I didn't, I wasn't prepared for cold weather at all. And I started thinking, it would really be nice if I had a pair of socks. Just something to keep my feet warm. Because I was suffering. And I went to visit a monk. And one of the first things he did, he looked at my feet, and my feet were blue. And he said, I, I want to give you some socks. He says, ah, sadhu. Yes, that's a good thing. And it turned on my sock karma. And within a week, I had, oh, nine or ten pairs of socks. And by the end of the range retreat, I must have had 24 pairs of socks. People kept on giving me socks. And to this day, people keep giving me socks. I went to California. Somebody gave me 24 pairs of socks. What in the world am I going to do with 24 pairs of socks? But I'm not going to say no. I don't want them. Because that will hurt their feelings. It's much more difficult to accept a gift than it is to give the gift. And that was one of the lessons I had to learn because I was great at giving, but somebody wanted to give something to me, and, oh no, I don't need it. But monks are in the position that they're not supposed to do that. So there is the acceptance of whatever is offered. Now, think of it this way. I go out on alms round. And somebody has been up for two hours cooking a very special kind of food to give to the monks. And that kind of food is not agreeable. What am I going to do? 
when they start to put it in the bowl, tell them, no thanks, I don't want that kind of food. That's like slapping them in the face. When somebody else wants to offer you something, whether you want it or not, you accept it with gratitude. Now, what you do with that gift after it's been given is up to you. And I learned that early on. I accept with this hand, gladly, loving kindness. And I give it away with that hand. <coughs> I supplied all of the monks that I was around with socks. And they appreciated it because it was cold. And it's, it, it's kind of a nuisance to carry around huge quantities of stuff as, as a monk. So you start giving away things. One of the gifts that seems to come towards me very often is Buddha images. Now, if I'm traveling, I don't want to carry a Buddha image that's this big with me. But I'll run across someone else that really appreciates that. So I give a blessing and give them the Buddha. So, the more you can practice your generosity and accept gifts, because that's part of generosity too, the more prosperous you become. And being prosperous doesn't necessarily mean money, but being prosperous means uh, can be friends and you, you become influential with them because they know you appreciate them and you want to share with them and that makes them happy and when they're happy I'm happy so it's a great way of uh, sharing and there is a uh, a thing that monks can perfect their generosity. It takes 12 years and you have to have agreement with whatever monastery you're staying at. And that is monks will go out on alms round and when they come back from the alms round, they go to the abbot and they say, is there any food here that you want? And they take whatever they want and you go to the next monk and say, the next senior monk, and you say, is there any food here that you want? And you keep on going till everybody in the monastery is fed before you go and eat. Now sometimes you might have to go on, out on alms round two or three times. The trick is you can't hold one thought moment of regret for giving that food to someone else. Now, sometimes monks are not as easy to get along with as, as you would think they should be. And if you share your food with that monk and he does something that you don't like, you can't regret giving him that food. Okay, you have to do this for 12 years without a break, every day. The advantage of sharing in that way is that wherever you happen to be, when it's time to eat, you'll always have food in the bowl 
whether anybody else is around or not. If you're out in the, uh, in the forest and it's getting time to get something to eat and you're too far away to go out on alms round, you open up your bowl and there's food there. <coughs> nice. Have I ever met a monk that has done that practice? No. It's difficult. For 12 years. But think of how kind and generous you develop your mind. The generosity just starts to be natural. Yes, here, here, take some of this. Whatever it is. It's nice to be around somebody that's like that because they make you happy and then you start practicing your generosity too. <coughs> but here, students, some man or woman gives food or requisites to recluses and Brahmins. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is wealthy. This is the way, student, that leads to wealth. Namely, one gives food and requisites to recluses or Brahmins. Here, student, some man or woman is obstinate and arrogant. He does not pay homage to one who should receive homage, does not rise up for one in whose presence he should rise up, does not offer a seat to one who deserves a seat, does not make way for one who he should make way for, and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated because of performing such undertaking, uh, because of performing and undertaking such action. He reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is born, he is low-born. This is the way, student, that leads to low birth. Namely, one is obstinate and arrogant and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. But here, student, some man or woman is not obstinate and arrogant. He pays homage to one who should receive homage, rises up for one in whose presence he should rise up, offers a seat to one who deserves a seat, makes way for one to whom he should make way, honors, respects, reveres, and venerates one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is high-born. Uh, the being influential and being high-born are close to the same. Where you say something, people, they, they listen. They try to pay attention because you're, you're very influential and you come from a very good cultured family. This is the way, student, that leads to high birth. Namely, one is not obstinate and arrogant 
and honors, respects, reveres, and venerates one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Here, student, some man or woman does not visit a recluse or Brahmin and ask, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable? What is blameless? What should be cultivated? What should not be cultivated? What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? So there are many questions that can be asked. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is stupid. This is the way, students, that leads to stupidity. Namely, one does not visit a recluse or Brahmin and ask such questions. Now, this is a quite a strong cultural thing, especially with the Chinese. They never ask questions. They're taught never to ask a question. And when I was... Uh, giving Dhamma talks in Malaysia, I was continually asking questions and wanting somebody to answer. And they would sit there and not do or say anything. So I would pull the sutta out and I would tell them that if you don't ask questions, and don't find out how things actually work and what the Dhamma is, that you're going to be reborn stupid. All of a sudden, some hands started coming up. Chinese, in particular, are very ambitious. So they wanted to be reborn clever. They wanted to be reborn very smart so that they could do the things they wanted to do without having a lot of problems. <coughs> now, the opposite is true. If you go and ask a lot of questions, you're going to be reborn intelligent. I was the I was a layman attendant for Usil Ananda, who was one of the brightest, most intelligent men I've ever met. When it came to anything to do with the Dhamma, he his mind was quick. He was right there and he could give you the answer. I didn't do it in front of other people, but when he and I got alone I bombarded him with questions. Every day I was asking him 10 or 12 or 15 questions. How does this work? I don't understand that. Teach me about this. I want to know more, more deeply how this stuff works. And after two years of that, one day I asked him a question and he stopped and he looked at me and he said when you're reborn a human being you're going to be smarter than Einstein you ask so many questions all the time I really like that I thought that was great <laughs> Because I ask so many questions, now I have a number of students that are paying me back and asking questions. If you have any doubts, if you have any things that you're not sure of, 
I will try to answer it if I know the answer. If I don't know the answer, I will tell you I don't know the answer. I don't know what to do, what to do with that. But I have enough books around that I can generally find the answer if it's Dhamma questions. Or I will tell the student, don't ask me that question, go to this book. See what it says there. When I was uh, first came back to this country, I'd been a monk for 12 years. And I was running across an awful lot of people that were reading a lot of books on Buddhism, but they weren't understanding what they were reading. Because there's so many things that are contradictory. So I told them, I don't want you to read anything for a year. If you want to practice with me, I don't want you to read, I want you to practice. And later I started making that less and less a period of time as people started to get better and better with the meditation. They started understanding it. Then it got to, well, you get to the fourth jhana, then you can start reading because you've heard the Dhamma talks and you know by your own direct experience what is right and what isn't. And then I had these little tiny books and I would say, here, read that. And it was just like one subject, read that. And then they'd come back and we would discuss. And then I'd give them another book and another and another. And uh, one of the things that I'm very generous with is books. As a result, I get a lot of books. And after a period of time, they would still come and be asking questions, and I'd, I'd give them more books that were bigger. And after a period of time, when they got used to that, then they would come and ask me a question, and I would tell them to go sit. and then I would give them other books to read. That's one of the things about this being a gradual practice is you have to read a lot of things over and over again expressed in different ways before it really gets set, especially when you're doing your own uh, meditation, you're seeing for yourself. Then I would give them the Majjhima Nikaya and they come with a question and say, you go find it yourself. Read this book, read that book, that'll give you the answer. Don't ask me that question. And that's a very effective way of learning Dhamma. Because you have the book learning and when somebody says something that's not quite right, You'll be able to see it and recognize it and go, wait, that doesn't sound right. And you'll be able to go and find in the suttas whether it was correct or not. So it gets easier and easier to explain to other people how this process works. So asking questions is the first part of learning how to be intelligent. Taking an interest, wanting to know. There is no such a thing as a dumb question. Uh, I remember when I was, the uh, first time I met Mahasi Sayada, I was with a large group of people. And all of the monks that he was traveling with wore glasses. 
And somebody said, does meditation make your eyes bad? And he gave a brilliant answer that was Dhamma. <sighs> but most people would consider that a dumb question. And that was the first time that I'd met Usilananda. I met Usilananda and Ujjanika, Mahasi Sayada, in in Hawaii. And then they moved to, or they moved to America. And then Usilananda was told, "I want you to stay, stay here and teach." I was exceptionally fortunate to be able to be his assistant because he had such a great mind and he was really kind and really generous and really helpful so as a result I picked up some of those qualities I'm not helpful all the time but a lot of the time I am <coughs> the student, the, the way that leads to short life makes people short-lived. The way that leads to long life makes people long-lived. The way that leads to sickliness makes people sickly. The way that leads to health makes people healthy. The way that leads to ugliness makes people ugly. The way that leads to beauty makes people beautiful. The way that leads to being uninfluential makes people uninfluential. The way that leads to being influential makes people influential. The way that leads to poverty makes people poor. The way that leads to wealth makes people wealthy. The way that leads to low birth makes people low born. The way that leads to high birth makes people high born. The way that leads to stupidity makes people stupid. The way that leads to wisdom makes people wise. Beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. When this was said, the Brahmin student Sabha, Todiya's son, said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and Sangha of monks. Let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. Anytime you hear that last little bit about Master Gotama being magnificent and doing all of these things, what that's actually talking about is that person has become a sotapanna. They have. There was something in the Dhamma of that discourse that clicked for them. So, what is the reason? why we are born into this life because of our past actions because of our past craving 
because of our habitual tendencies. And when you start changing unwholesome habitual tendencies into wholesome habitual tendencies, then it helps you develop your wisdom. It helps you to be able to see how these links of dependent origination arise. Why do formations arise? Because of your past action and craving. When you practice and see and start letting go of the formations, there is no more condition. You're going beyond karma. This is a problem that the many of the Brahmins and the Hindus have. It is a problem because they believe that there's a continual birth or a reincarnation. And you're re either reincarnating up to get off to, to become one with Brahma or God or whatever. Or you're spiral spiraling down and you're going to be reborn as a as a, a hungry ghost or even in the hell realms of which there are many. So karma is the thing that follows you around until you learn to go beyond those actions and you learn how to do it by understanding exactly how everything actually does work. Okay? So, Yeah, and Bhikkhu Bodhi lately in his, some of his later editions of the Majjhima Nikaya has changed right thought of the Eightfold Path into right intention. And I have a lot of problem with that because who is intending? So, and and you can go in a deeper way and say, well, yeah, that's actually really true. That That is what's happening. You do have a decision to make of either 6R or get caught up in. But <coughs> I use the word imaging because that to me is closer to what the Buddha actually meant by right thought. What kind of an image do you hold of yourself? Do you hold an image of being kind and reverent and ven you venerate the, the right things? Or are you not that way? So when you start imaging the wholesome and showing respect and doing things that are very helpful not only to you but to everyone else around you then you're holding this image of wholesomeness that comes with you as as you tread the spiritual life and it's a, it's, it's clearer that way to me I hope it is to everybody else. And in a way, intention is correct, 
but the way most people think about intention, it has to do with what I want instead of what needs to be done. Uh, a lot of the, I mean, you, you get the book, The Secret. It's all about intention. But it's intention for me to get wealthy and successful and it's, it has a lot of craving in it. But when you, when you add the right, uh, their harmonious imaging with harmonious perspective, that turns it into a very wholesome, good uh, path leading to Nibbana. Okay. And yeah. I like it that you ask questions. Believe me, I really do. Depending, uh, you see, we've been around for a long, 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 long time. Even the Buddha could not purify every action that he ever did. And why do I say that? Because in his later life, he had back pain. And he knew the reason for that back pain because he was a wrestler or fighter and he used to break people's back. And as a result of that karma, he had back pain in his last life. Mogalana, in one of his many past lifetimes, uh, his his mother and father were very ancient. They were old and they were both blind. So he had to take care of them. Which he did without any problem until he married a woman and she got tired of taking care of the old people and said, why don't you go off and get rid of them? Go kill them. We don't need this. So he put them in a cart and took them off and after a period of time he jumped out of the cart and started making sounds like there was uh, a band of evil people coming around. And he started hitting them with sticks and stones and things like that. And their only concern was that their son would not have this and they kept on telling him to run away, get away from these people, don't let them harm you, it doesn't matter about us. And Mogalana uh, started feeling very guilty, but by that time both of them were so injured that they both died. He spent a long time in a hell realm because of that in his last birth. Uh, he was older than the Buddha. Both, both Sariputta and Moggallana were older than the Buddha so by 15 or 20 years. And uh, there was a place that was kind of a favorite place for Moggallana called Vulture's Peak in India. And he would come down every morning for alms round. And there was a, a queen that was holding a grudge against all of the Sangha members, but especially Mogulana. And she hired a bunch of thugs and they would 
they knew his what he was going to be doing and they would converge where he was. And when he saw them coming, he would use his psychic ability and fly away. After a short period of time of every day this happening, they were coming for him and he tried to get his ability to fly working and it didn't and in his mind he said ah now I'm paying for my past actions and they beat him up thoroughly they said in, in I think it's a commentary I don't think it's a sutta that they beat him up so bad that not one piece of bone in his body was bigger than a grain of rice. I mean, they really did it to him. While they were doing that to his body, he got into the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, so it didn't hurt. And then when they went away, he saw what had happened to his body and he had gained his psychic ability to fly and he went back to the Buddha and paid homage to him and thanked him for what he had done and then he went off and died on his own. So, no, there is some karma that you still have to pay, but when you have attained Nibbana and become an Arahat, it doesn't make your mind shake at all. Physical pain, eh, okay, so what? Now the Buddha would, his back became very painful. It didn't shake his mind at all, but he knew that if he continued sitting, he would harm himself even more, so he would say, I've got to lie down. Now, in the suttas, it talks about him lying down, and it infers that he went to sleep. But that is not what he did. He lied down to give his back some relief, and he would listen to Ananda or one of the other monks finish the Dhamma talk. So... We have been around so long that if you put all of the tears that we have shed over the lifetimes, they would fill up the oceans. Okay, that we've been around a long, long time. We've done a lot of good things. We've done a lot of bad things. We've had immeasurable amounts of suffering and pain. When you start letting go of the craving and relaxing more and more, then when pain arises, it doesn't grab you so tightly, so you can start relaxing into it and letting it be. You're gaining more and more equanimity all the time. And equanimity is a very good thing to have because doesn't matter whether it's pain or pleasure, your mind stays in balance. And that's what happens when you start attaining the, the different stages of awakening. And it gets to be more and more subtle. Craving is probably the sneakiest thing that we can experience because we think we've let go of craving and there's some little tiny thing that pops up and you about to relax and let it be and as you go deeper it gets more subtle okay So why don't we share some merit? <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. 
May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad.